if civil war comes, and I do think it is imminent, you're quite right. It will for us be the price of freedom. Our people here have for a long time been prepared for this eventuality and I am confident of their readiness. I think that when it does come, that the people on the other side would be surprised as to what they're going to get. And I'm confident that it will not last long. When General Chukwemeka Ojuku declared Biafra's independence in May 1967, not many could have predicted the level of carnage and devastation that would befall the people of southeastern Nigeria over the course of the next three years. Having concluded that their people were no longer safe anywhere within the borders of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, the political leaders of the Igbo ethnic group decided that the only way to save their people from ethnic persecution was to break away and form their own country. Buried deep underneath the Biafran soil was one of Africa's largest reserves of crude oil. And emboldened by the seemingly infinite money-making potential of this precious black toxin, Biafra's new leaders charged forward in full confidence that the very ground they walked on was their golden ticket to becoming a true African powerhouse. But just as they fueled the Biafran fight for independence, the region's vast deposits of black gold also reinforced the Nigerian government's resolve to extinguish the Biafran uprising by any means necessary. With the newly independent states attempting to take away an estimated 67% of Nigeria's oil reserves, the stage had been set for what would ultimately go down as the most violent conflict in West African history. For three grueling years, the Nigerian and Biafran armies would engage in a raging battle for dominance in which an estimated 2 million civilians would lose their lives due to starvation and disease. But as with virtually all modern conflicts, the battle would be much more than just a violent exchange of bullets and explosives. The Nigerian civil war would see both belligerents engage in wartime propaganda with a level of sophistication never before seen on African soil. According to the Nigerians, the Biafran state was nothing more than a rogue insurgency sponsored by nefarious foreign powers seeking to destabilize and disintegrate a promising African country. The Biafran narrative, on the other hand, invoked a much more visceral reaction. Their message to the international community was that the Nigerian state had adopted a policy of ethnic cleansing against the Igbo people, and so Biafran independence was the only way to protect themselves from complete annihilation by a Nigerian state whose only interest was in the exploitation of Biafra's precious oil reserves. But if the general rule is that history is written by the victors, then the Nigerian civil war might just be the exception. Although the war ultimately ended with a victory for the Nigerian army, the Biafran wartime message would have a long-lasting impact on how Nigeria's oil wealth would come to be viewed in the years following the war. You see, one of the interesting paradoxes of the Biafran struggle was that in breaking away from Nigeria, the Igbo leaders also took with them a significant number of minority ethnic groups which were also native to southeastern Nigeria. And although many international observers ultimately came to associate Nigeria's oil with the Igbo struggle for independence, the true heirs of Nigeria's oil wealth in the strictest sense were the various minority ethnic groups of Nigeria's Niger Delta region. 
When added together, these groups amounted to as high as an estimated 40% of the wartime Biafran population. And although many of them would remain relatively unknown both during and after the war, they would arguably be the worst affected victims of the never-ending struggle for Nigeria's oil. One of such minority groups were the Ogonis, a poor but proud people who despite occupying a territory smaller than the size of Hong Kong, boasted of one of the deepest and most sought after crude oil deposits in the entire world. Representing less than 1% of Nigeria's population, the Ogonis could perhaps be best described as a micro-minority ethnic group. According to folklore, the Ogonis traced their lineage all the way back to the ancient Ghana Empire, located in modern-day Mali. And according to linguistic studies, the Ogonis are likely to have been one of the earliest settlers in the region. As with most Nigerian ethnic minorities, the end of the civil war in 1970 hardly changed their fortunes. In fact, post-war Nigeria would be not so much divided by ethnicity as it was divided by the haves and the have-nots. With various military dictators taking turns at the helm of power and oil prices flying sky-high, Nigeria in the 70s, 80s and 90s became a perfect illustration of what political scientists referred to as a rentier state. A country which was solely dependent on bribes, rents and taxes paid by foreign businesses in exchange for raw natural resources. With the oil money in full flow, Nigeria's leaders really didn't need the economy as a whole to perform in order to fill their pockets. And even better, neither did they need to rely on the approval of an electorate. Aside from a very brief period of democracy under President Shehu Shagari between 1979 and 1983, Nigeria would remain under the firm grip of a host of military dictators. And so from the end of the civil war, right up until the creation of the Fourth Nigerian Republic in May 1999, the post-war Nigerian state basically had no civil contract with the Nigerian people. The only relationship that mattered to Nigeria's leaders were the numerous opaque agreements with the multinational oil companies operating within the country's oil sector. And of all the casualties of the unholy post-war alliance between the Nigerian military state and Big Oil, the Ogoni people were undoubtedly amongst the worst hit. With the full blessing of the Nigerian government, the Royal Dutch Shell Oil Company was authorized to explore and extract oil from Ogoni land. While this was a win-win deal for Nigeria's military generals and the oil giant, Shell's entry into the region quickly became nothing short of a living nightmare for the Ogoni people. In a strongly worded letter sent to Shell's headquarters in the city of Port Harcourt just three months after the end of the civil war, a group of Ogoni leaders and representatives raised concerns about the serious damage being done to their land by Shell. According to the letter, the Ogoni roadways had begun collapsing under the sheer weight of Shell's machinery and the fishing and farming industries, which had been part and parcel of the Ogoni way of life for centuries, were now under significant threat from oil spills in their farmlands and rivers. Responding to the allegations levied against them, Shell swiftly dismissed the Ogoni's claims as nothing more than a dishonest attempt to blackmail them into paying money to the Ogoni leadership and forcing Shell to build free local infrastructure. But just two weeks after Shell sent this response, a catastrophic incident would occur in the heart of Ogoni land. On the 19th of July 1970, an oil wellhead exploded, hurling fire and hot oil into the Ogoni skies. Within the space of a few days, the Ogoni's main sources of drinking water had been completely poisoned. Farmers began staying away from their own farms for fear of igniting fires, and those who were brave enough to return found themselves waddling around in crude oil. For three long weeks, the oil spill continued unabated contaminating everything it came into contact with, from the Ogoni's air, to their land, and most importantly, their waterways.
And unfortunately, the July 1970 oil spill would just be one amongst a long list of similarly devastating incidents that would occur over the course of the next three decades. In fact, by the end of the 1990s, the total amount of crude oil spilled in Ogoni land would reportedly reach as high as a combined total of 2.5 million barrels. Monitoring the oil spills from his offices in the city of Port Harcourt was the renowned Ogoni writer and film producer, Ken Sarawiwa. After a short career in government, Sarawiwa had risen to become arguably the most well-known Ogoni in all of Nigeria, thanks to the success of his hit comedy show, Bassi and Company. Centered around the life and trials of a small-time con man and his various get-rich-quick schemes, the popularity of Sarawiwa's comedy show was largely due to his light-hearted critique of the get-rich-quick mindset that had become prevalent at every level of Nigerian society. It's all roses, so it cheers, let me tell you what to do. If you want to be a millionaire, behave like a millionaire, act like a millionaire, millions will be yours. If you want to be a millionaire, think like a millionaire, act like a millionaire, and the millions will be yours. Ha ha, ba ba Mr. B, Mr. B, uh, I'm hungry. <laughs> I thought you stumbled across the street party last night. Yes. Didn't you eat enough? I did. That was 12 hours ago. <laughs> I'm hungry again. Having grown sick and tired of the military government's complicity in the devastation of his ancestral land, Sarawiwa spearheaded the creation of a pressure group known as the Movement for the Survival of the Ogoni People which was popularly known as Mosop. With the approval of the elders and traditional rulers of the Ogoni communities, Ken Sarawiwa drew up a Bill of Rights mandating greater financial and political autonomy for the Ogoni people. He then sent his Bill of Rights to the military government alongside an urgent demand for protection against Shell's devastation of their land and property. But with Sarawiwa's Mosop group having virtually no bargaining power, the Nigerian government's response was to simply brush them aside and carry on with business as usual. Deciding that more drastic measures were needed, Sarwiwa organized a mass protest on the 3rd of January 1993, in which he mobilized an estimated one-third of the entire Ogoni population to come out in peaceful protest against Shell's exploitation and the Nigerian government's betrayal of Ogoni land. We are going to demand our rights peacefully, non-violently, and we shall win. Although the January 1993 protests succeeded in raising international awareness about the plight of the Ogoni people, the demonstrations would have no immediate impact on Shell's operations. In the weeks following the protest, Shell continued to expand its operations in Ogoni land as it bought up more concessions, dug through farmlands, and devastated more Ogoni communities with the full blessing and protection of the Nigerian military. Taking matters into their own hands? Sariwa's Mosop quickly adopted a more radical approach by rallying the Ogoni youth to sabotage Shell's infrastructure and intimidate their workers. And within a short period of time, Sariwa's Mosop had succeeded in forcing Shell to pause his operations in Ogoni land. But with a significant chunk of the Nigerian military government's income stream now at risk due to Mosop's activities in Ogoni land, Ken Sarwiwa quickly went from being a small irritation to the single biggest internal threat to the Nigerian state. Moving swiftly and decisively, the military government led by General Ibrahim Babangida 
hastily announced the infamous Decree No. 29, which mandated a death penalty for anyone uttering words, flying a flag, or publishing material that was capable of causing violence or encouraging ethnic nationalism. The Babangida regime also reportedly deployed a special task force into Ogoni land to carry out undercover operations aimed at manufacturing fake tribal wars and using them as an excuse for the summary execution of most sub members. These covert military operations would allegedly continue up until November 1993 when General Sani Abacha replaced General Ibrahim Babangida as Nigeria's military head of state. Under Abacha's rule, the Nigerian military government switched to more drastic measures as it immediately deployed 400 military officers into Ogoni land with direct instructions to attend Mosop demonstrations and open fire on activists whenever possible. But even with the increasing number of casualties under Abacha's rule, Sarawira continued to encourage resistance and inspire more and more Ogoni youth to join his movement. But unfortunately, his fervent desire to continue in the fight, despite the shoot-to-kill policy adopted by the Nigerian government, would ultimately lead to a division within the Mosop leadership. With the increasing amount of Ogoni youth, losing their lives in the fight against the Nigerian military government. Some Ogoni elders denounced Sariwa as being too militant and began calling for Mosop to seek to engage in peaceful negotiations with the Abacha regime. Taking full advantage of the Ogoni's internal squabble, the Abacha regime would allegedly orchestrate one of the most cold-blooded conspiracies in Nigerian history. On the 21st of May 1994, four Ogoni chiefs were seized during a meeting of elders and brutally murdered by a mob of angry youth. Although Sariwa was not actually in Ogoni land on the day of the murders, he was arrested on suspicion of having orchestrated the killings as all four of the deceased chiefs were public critics of Sariwa's activism. Despite completely denying all charges, he was imprisoned for over a year before he was eventually brought to face trial in front of a special tribunal. With the panel of judges suspected to have been handpicked by General Sani Abacha himself, and many of the prosecution's witnesses later admitting to having been bribed to give false testimony, Sariwa was brought to face trial in front of a textbook kangaroo court. As one of the most well-known political prisoners of the infamous Abacha regime, Sariwa's trial garnered a great deal of international coverage. But despite the global outcry against the unfairness of his arrest and trial, Ken Sariwa was ultimately found guilty and sentenced to death alongside eight other leading members of his movement. The Ogoni Nine, as they would forever be known, were executed by the Abacha regime on the 10th of November 1995. After surviving four unsuccessful attempts by the executioner, Sariwa finally succumbed to death by hanging and his immortal last words were recorded as, Lord take my soul, but the struggle continues. The execution of the Ogoni Nine provoked strong international condemnation of the Abacha regime by the United Nations and arms embargoes were imposed on Nigeria by the European Union and the United States. British Prime Minister John Major called the executions a judicial murder, while South Africa's Nelson Mandela, Zimbabwe's Robert Mugabe 
and Daniel Arap Moy of Kenya all called for Nigeria's suspension from the Commonwealth of Nations. But after all was said and done, the international outcry and sanctions eventually subsided and the Abati regime quickly returned to business as usual. With the Sarawiwa threat neutralized, oil production gradually returned to relative stability and thanks to its control of Nigeria's free-flowing oil revenue, the Abacha regime would ultimately go on to become perhaps the most prolific kleptocratic Nigerian regime of all time. In fact, Abacha's government will be so successful at looting that even over two decades since his death in 1998, no one knows exactly how much money was stolen during his time as Nigeria's military head of state. The Ken Sarewa story is undoubtedly one of the saddest tragedies in Nigerian history. But while his life may have been brutally cut short, his immortal last words will forever continue to resonate in the hearts and minds of the ever-growing number of Nigerian youth that choose to continue in the seemingly never-ending struggle against the Nigerian establishment and its treacherous alliance with Big Oil. Once again, it's KB Taiwo for New Africa. If you've enjoyed this video and would like to see more content like this, then please like and share this video and also consider supporting us on Patreon at www patreon.com slash newafrica. Thanks again for all your support and until next time.